And I'd like to welcome Yale Strom to the Rabbi's Neighborhood. Yale is one of the world's leading ethnographer artists of klezmer and Roma music and history. He has conducted extensive ethnographic research throughout Eastern Europe and the Balkans since 1981. He has made nine documentary films, written 13 books, has had numerous photo exhibitions throughout the world. And with his band, Yale Strom and Hot Pastrami, he has made 15 recordings. They run the gamut from traditional klezmer to new Jewish jazz. He's also composed for theater, film, radio, television, symphony, and orchestras and various artists such as Rachel Barton Pine, Sarah Caswell, Salman Ahmad, and many others. His latest documentary film is American Socialist, The Life and Times of Eugene Victor Debs. Newest music recording is Yale Strom's Broken Consort, Shimmering Lights, and his latest audio drama at audible.com is Debs in Canton. He is currently artist in residence professor in the Jewish Studies program at San Diego State University. Prior to this, Strom taught at New York University where he created a course in ethnography and art that is taught to this day. You can, at, you can, you can access everything he's, uh, he's done at www.yalestrom.com. I will have the domain up at the end of the episode. Yale, welcome to the Rabbi's Neighborhood. Thank you, Rabbi. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. So right off the bat, what brings a person to become uh, one of the world's leading ethnographer artists of klezmer and Roma music? Well, um, you know, I guess uh, the trajectory was um, I had graduated from San Diego State University with a couple BAs. I had one in American Studies, one in furniture design, actually was working uh, in a furniture factory for a while, whatever. It wasn't wasn't quite the path that I wanted to take it was getting a little boring, et cetera, et cetera. And so I thought it was, I thought, wow, what am I going to do with my life? Of course, you know, being 22, 23, it's as if I had to know right away, but then I felt pressure. My dad would had already done this at 23 and my mom, you know, what am I doing? Anyhow. So I, I thought about law school because I'm also an animal that comes from a home. I was raised in a home with a lot of, uh, you know, social conscience. And, and I thought, well, maybe, and originally I'm from Detroit, raised in then San Diego. So maybe labor law, I don't know, something. And of course my parents said, oh, okay. I think he's, that, that's great. So as I was preparing to, um, as I applied for law school and then um, was waiting for the, um, the acceptances as well as the rejections, um, I went to a klezmer dance down in San Diego um, it was one of the early revival bands. This is back in, uh, wow, 1981. And um, there was a band called the Big Jewish Band. It had like 15 members. But what was unique about it is, and I knew Jewish music. I grew up in a home where we sang Hasidic melodies and Zemiris, you know, Sabbath table songs, Hebrew songs, some Yiddish folk songs. But the instrumental klezmer, as we know, is Freilachs Bulgars wedding music, simcha music, I had heard, but that wasn't part of my family tradition. But anyhow, they were playing this band in, in a not a Jewish edifice, a club downtown. Um, they had some interesting arrangements. There were people there of all backgrounds and having a good time dancing. I went up to the leader and said, hey, I was really moved. I said, would you consider, could I join perhaps or jam with the violin, something? Basically, he said, um, don't call us, we'll call you, <laughs> type uh -huh. of thing. Uh -huh. right. Anyhow, whatever, I came home 3 a.m. that morning and literally a light bulb went off in my head and, um, you know, these moments in life, I'm sure you've had them, Rabbi, where you just, you know, you were going down this one path and it's not just a slight turn, you almost like make it like a 360 right. or 180. And light bulb went off and I said, well, they say, if you can't beat them, join them. No, if you can't beat them, form your own. So I decided to form my own klezmer band. But I thought, okay, if you're forming something that already is an entity for a niche audience, let's submit, am I going to just copy and do the exact same thing? Because people are going to say, well, we know this man for the last two, three years. Eh, we'll go, you know, we know this restaurant, restaurant A. It's been serving the same Jewish deli. This new one, uh, you know, we'll, we'll stay with the one that's been around for a long time. So I thought, okay, what will make it different? And I thought, I bet there might be, might be perhaps some melodies that are still in the memories of those still Jews living in Eastern Europe, Holocaust survivors, um, and perhaps other people, 
Gentiles who, who played music with Jews or went to a wedding, whatever, I wasn't sure. And so I bought a one-way ticket, one-way ticket to then the East Block. Um, thought I was going to be gone a couple months and end up being a little over a year. And came home and with a good buddy of mine who's still in the band, a bassist, who's a virtuoso player, began playing in the symphony at the age of like 17, um, formed Hot Pastrami. And then real quick, um, so my interest was focused on these these Jews, what memories, did you play music? Did you listen to music? Did you know someone know music? But then I realized that my interest and the questions open up broader subjects that they weren't just focusing, how they survived, why they returned, didn't go to Israel or Western Europe or America or wherever. What kind of Jewish lives have they been leading, if any? And, and other aspects of that culture. And then the other thing, is I'm meeting another group of people I've never studied about, heard only in terms of stereotypes and stories and movies, and that was, quote, the gypsies or Roma, the, the proper term. Uh, gypsies, by the way, comes from the misnomer, the misconception that they come from Egypt, gypsy, Egypt. Hmm. They don't. Hmm. <laughs> they're from, they're India. They're from Rajasthan. They're from Northwest India and Southeast uh, Pakistan. <clears throat> but anyhow, and I'm saying, oh, in certain regions of Eastern Europe, particularly in Romania, Carpathian, Ukraine, Eastern Hungary, Roma also played with Jews. Who are these people? Why? What was the relationship between these two minorities? And then, and then I came back for the band, then decided to go back a couple of years later to not just interview uh, these people, but to photograph them. And, and as I said, to open the area of my focus to looking at just their lives and cultures and the people they affected it, et cetera. And as they say, the rest is history. I, I, photography and writing. And I became fascinated with these people um, that uh, were at one time the remnants of this Yiddish culture. Though there was some Sephardic culture. And well, you know, Bulgaria was more Sephardic Jews and former Yugoslavia Sephardic Jews. Um, that return, it was interesting. And, and so when people would tell me, oh yeah, oh, wonderful idea to, you know, to start a, a classroom in. Eastern Europe, Jews, it's, it's a, a cemetery, uh, you know, or you'll find a few old Jews, a few old Jews standing by the shul begging, you know, for Nadovas, you know. Uh, and they're telling me this, I said, well, let me find out for myself. And um, there were some aspects of what they said they were true but there were many aspects that weren't. And as I say, the thing about Eastern Europe during that period, particularly when it comes to Jewish life, mm -hmm. there was nothing completely black and nothing completely white, but many shades of gray. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's what was fascinating. So just the people, the culture, the music, and um, the stories, et cetera, and using the ethnographic research. So the interviews, the photography, the film, uh, the stories I heard and creating then work. Now I could have gone into and gone directly for my PhD, written um, a, a, th a, a, a doctoral thesis or written for um, you know um, academic magazines and journals, which is perfectly fine. And, and I've had stuff published and kind of kept my focus there for the 500 to maybe thousand people that read it, will read it. But no, I wanted my work, my research to be, become more of art that reached the masses, not only just Jewish masses, but masses throughout the world. And, and, and I don't have to tell you, you being a, a filmmaker, film, you, you can hit a lot of people and can influence people. So that's, that's what kind of brought me here. And I, I should say that um, uh, this conversation was, was arranged by Leslie Katzman, um, uh, who works at a Dutch Shalom, who, um, who's been great and, and generous in introducing me to a friend, you know, and we were already discussing the possibility of screening one of your films, The Last Klezmer, in the community um, and the programming committee that's now up and running uh, um, uh, is, is, uh, in, is considering it. Um, so this might be the beginning of a of a Yale Strom a thon. Uh, we might bring you back to talk about the movie. But 
so, so let me ask you just a couple more questions before we get to your performance. Um, you get to Eastern Europe. Where in Eastern Europe did you go? Well, I started in Vienna. That's Central Europe. That was the largest city, the portal, quote, in, in, in the free West Europe. And the first city, and I didn't know anything. I had, um, I had traveled and I lived in Sweden in the past. I had been to the Soviet Union, but the Eastern European countries had not been to. So I'm thinking like, well, let me go south and kind of make a circle and come back around. So I, from Vienna, the very first city I went to was Zagreb. Now, when we hear Zagreb, which today, of course, is the capital of Croatia, um, uh, most American Jews uh, don't think of Zagreb, Yiddish culture, klezmer, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, steeped in all this East European Jewish history. You know, we don't think of Zagreb. Now, Zagreb did have, d- does, did have a Jewish past. Um, it's inter- interesting. So I started there and my very first place, um, which I document, by the way, in a book called A Wandering Feast, A Journey Through the Jewish Culture of Eastern Europe, or you just remember A Wandering Feast. And it's, it's really an autobiography of that year. And it also includes recipes of foods I ate because the, uh, the publisher said, well, you were a vegetarian when it was not hip or cool to be vegetarian. How did you, what did you eat those days? But anyhow, um, I get to Zagreb and my first place that I stayed and lived in was a Jewish old age home. I lived in a Jewish old age home boy, oh. in my 20s. You're like um, I met them, I had an address and they were kind of astonished. I'll just tell you the quick story. They knock on the door, it's raining, I'm outside. A lady comes in, They like three ladies are wearing these nightgowns. They have their sleeping caps on. And one lady, and she starts speaking Serbo Croatian. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know. I knew, you know, like two words. She says, says, you speak English? I said, I do. She says, it's, oh, it's rather late, young man, to visit your grandmother. Can you come back tomorrow? <laughs> I said, I don't have a grandmother. Oh, your grandfather, he's probably sleeping. No, I don't have a grandfather. And it went on like this. And then finally I said, please, it's raining. I just came for the, I, I told my whole life story in 60 seconds. I'll sleep on your floor with my sleeping bag. They said, they closed the door. I hear murmuring, talk, talk, talk. They opened the door and they said, listen, we have a room, we'll, we have a room. You can stay there for a week, but you have to play music for us every day at lunchtime. Agreed. And thus began my research. And then of course, now I've got a couple tunes from that area and, um, but other areas that are more, when we think of you know Yiddish culture, Poland, Ukraine, et cetera. But that when was you, my stay. When you went to Europe in your 20s, did you already speak Yiddish? I spoke a little Yiddish from home, a, a, a little, a, a street Yiddish, a gas Yiddish. Uh, I, I heard it, I learned it from my paternal uh, grandma, my baba, my father's mother, who was born in a town called Stolin, which uh, for people who know anything about a Hasidic culture, the Stolin or Hasidim are well known for being singers. You know, they say fabrente daveners, they burn when they daven, mm-hmm. when they pray. Um, so I knew a little bit, but I quickly get a couple, get a dictionary, swallow uh, words, you know, and then I took some formal uh, classes at the uh, YIVO Institute and Columbia University, and just by use, by use, by use. So I'm fairly conversant. I wouldn't say my grammar, you know, I wouldn't want to give a lecture uh, on Shakespeare in right, Yiddish, right, of course, but, of but I was able to make myself understood. And then I picked up some local, fra- I, I picked up enough of some local words. I, I, I can speak, a, a, you know, a passable Polish. And so, you know, but good question. Cause a lot of people said, oh, how was, well, my Yiddish was okay, but what if they spoke no Yiddish? Well, German, well, what they, nothing. I said, you know what language I spoke? I said, the, the language that opened up more doors than if you, the ethnographer, sociologist, cultural anthropologist went, who didn't have the skill that I did, my doors opened much more. And they said, what, is, what tool is that to use? I said, I use the tool, the violin. And they say, ah, and that's what really set me apart from other social cultural anthropologists is, um, yes, you wanna come armed with history and knowledge, but the violin music, we know it. Why people love music? I don't care what culture it is in the world. You know, we're we're a musical beings. Our heart pumps and at a rhythm in our our lungs. So that really opened up the doors and allowed me access to certain memories that many people had pushed back because often they were sad. That's a perfect segue um, 
uh, into you performing with the violin. But I have to tell you that one of the reasons I love talking to you is that the the Yiddishkeit, the Jewishness just oozes through all the stories. Like even the names of the band, the big band, only, <laughs> only Jews, the big Jewish band. Like you, you tell your grandmother you're in a Jewish band. Don't worry, grandma, it's a big band. It's, it's a, it's a river, <laughs> you know, and the hot pastrami and the long Jewish feast. These are, these are all ideas that just, um, the Judaism just oozes out. <laughs> I'll play a melody that is considered the most famous Jewish melody among Hungarian Jews, um, particularly Eastern Hungary, but even in Western part, you know, Budapest, but Eastern Hungary, towns like Debrecen, and Mishkolz, smaller little villages, Shachal Rai Uheli, where uh, the, um, the, uh, the Satmar Rebbe had been at one time uh, in the 19th century, early 20th century, and 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 that re and as we know, Hungary was once Austro-Hungary, so it was a large empire until the uh, end of uh, World War One. And so uh, the Hungarian, the Magyar, the Hungarian influence is 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 was quite strong, and as strong as we say the Austrian German influence. But we forget about that. And so what's interesting before I start the song is so in the Carpathian Ukraine, uh, in Western Romania. Romania in Slovakia, Eastern Slovakia, in the uh, uh, parts of Croatia, um, uh, particularly Northern Croatia, when I, went, met, when I met Jews, older Jews, Jews who had survived the Holocaust, their orientation in terms of their Jewish focus was not uh, Yugoslavian, Romanian, Slovakian, what was it? It was Hungarian, even though they were living in these other countries because the Magyar culture, the Hungarian culture. So they would speak Hungarian. Sometimes they spoke Yiddish and then they spoke, you know, serbo croat or Romanian and so forth. So I found that fascinating. So this melody, very short, was, I think it was all of eight bars. So I had the chutzpah to write another, some more bars to it. And play as many and, bars as you'd like. Go, go all right. Play. What's it called? It's called, okay. It's called Sol Akakashmar, S-Z-O-L. A, next word, kakash, K-A-K-A-S, next word, M-A-R, simply means when the rooster crows. So initially it was a song about a shepherd with his flock of sheep in the mountains for several months before he comes down to bring him uh, to the lower pastures for like the uh, getting closer to fall, winter. And he longs for his girlfriend. So every time the rooster crows and the sun's coming up, He's thinking maybe I'll see her coming over the horizon. When the Rabbi Isaac Yitzchak, uh, who was the founder of the Kala, uh, he was the Naj Kala, or they call him the Kala Varebi, uh, Eastern Hungary. And there's still a small group of uh, Balabat team uh, followers of that Rebbe. He's wandering and he hears his song and the apocryphal story is he has the the young peasant boy teach him. And the more the young peasant boy taught him, the more the rabbi learns it and the less that the peasant boy knows it till finally it becomes his. And simply when the rooster crows, who is he hoping comes above the horizon? Mashiach. <laughs>
Nice. Beautiful. Beautiful. And you'd learn, you'd learn these tunes uh, through your travels or you, le you learn these tunes here and you, you go over there? No, go ahead. I've, uh, I've learned many tunes, of course, here in the United States, but I've learned many, many tunes through my travels. Tunes that were in the memories, as you say, in yes, the Zichroinus, uh, in the memories of those Jews. Sometimes I was lucky enough to find some archives, whether it was personal archives at someone's home or in some libraries um, and that kind of And learning melodies, for, as I said, some, from some non-Jews, particularly the Roma, who said, oh, we used to play this song, song and they, you know, it's um, at this particular Jewish party. And I'd say, well, I've never heard that. So I, I learned from them. And, um, and so I'm proud to say that there's many melodies. Uh, you know, I've published this one book called uh, The Complete, The Absolutely Complete Jewish Songbook with, I forgot, 300 and some melodies. And, the, and, and the, I said to the publisher, why'd you pick that number for me to put in? He says, a melody Yale for every day of the week, except Shabbos. <laughs> then we'll just sing. <laughs> so I said, okay. But why I mentioned that book the absolutely complete Klezmer songbook is there's probably 50, 60 of those tunes that are tunes that I uh, found that most likely would have vanished forever. So that I feel good that I brought melodies back that, that could have completely um, been lost. Now, my, all four of my grandparents are survivors. My mother's side is from Ludge, Poland. My father's side is from the Carpathian Mountains in Czechoslovakia. Oh, where? So um, my father's side, my, my grandfather is from an area called Chist. Oh, uh, Chist, I've been to Chist. You've been, you've been to Chist, terrific. So, so if you had told my grandparents that you wanted to go back to these places to visit, they would have looked at you like you were absolutely insane. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's how they raised us to, ne there's nothing back. Don't ever go back, the, you know, that's, that's a chapter of our family that we closed. Now we came and it's about uh, looking forward. Um, when you went back and, and met with Jews there, did they think you were crazy for coming back? Like Jews from America interested in learning melodies from them. Was this like the, the ultimate level of privilege or was this like um, they, were, they were happy to have connection with, with, uh, with you know, a, a future? You know, it was a combination. That's a very good question. Some kind of like, what? You couldn't find Jews in New York, you know, Borough Park, or Florida, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Los Angeles. Um, and I said, you know, and I said, no, of course I could. I can go to archives there too in the libraries. But I said, so So I, I was honest with them. Some I said, first, it's a good excuse to travel because I got the travel bug when I had lived abroad, when I had studied in Sweden for a year, you know, my junior year abroad, so to speak. And um, so I like that. Um, but what I really liked is sitting literally sometimes on the floor at their knees at the dinner table at the edge of their bed and hearing stories because it reminded me of stories that I had heard from my grandparents and, um, and just stories I had read in books and films. Um, and they were, they were really pleased to see that I was um, interested in them truly, um, that I played the violin and played Jewish music. And, and speaking of that first city, Zagreb, Tzili, Tzili, interesting story, survived in Morocco, whatever, went to Sweden, moved back to Zagreb, had three husbands. She was 91 years, 91 years old, looked like she was 71. She said, yeah, well, you know, if you stay longer, maybe we'll become husband and wife. I said, well, that, that'll make the news. <laughs> Yale, 20, 24, marries 91 year old woman. But she just had fire in her. But she said to me the last day as a group of women went with me to the train station to say goodbye as I was on my way to my next destination. And she said, Yale. Actually, she said Yitzchak. Because Yale, then, ah, Yale, what, what, what's made Yale? What, what does Yale mean? You know, uh, Yitzchak, ah, Yitzchak, we understand. Yale is such a Goetia nomen, you know, <laughs> it's such a gentle name. Um, they said, Yitzchak, remember that these songs and melodies are more than just notes on a page. They represent the lives of those who came before us or who were with us at the time but did not have the mazel 
to survive. And you need to not just collect them and leave them in a, in a manila folder or in a cabinet, or she saw then I had cassette tape recorders on that cassette tape recorder. You have to let other people hear them. They have to live. And I promised her I would do that. And I have to say, if, to my credit, if I may say so, I have done that. Many of the tunes that on my recordings and some of the tunes that I've used for background music in my films, I've, um, I learned from these people and it encouraged me also to write new music. So, um, you know, it, it, you, you never know where one's going to find inspiration, but I've been so grateful that uh, I met these people. I see them in my head. Of course, many, many, uh, most, you know, because they were already getting up there in their years, have passed on, but, um, you know, uh, they live on through my work. And I just want to say an aside, uh, if I may, so Hist, which I've been to, and I have some interesting photos, even footage, but if, if the committee likes The Last Klezmer and they're not tired of Yelstrom, this is a film that you will love, Rabbi. I have a film called Carpati, 50 Miles, 50 Years, narrated by Leonard Dimoy. And it's about my journey in the Carpathian Ukraine, about an ice cream vendor who returned. And it's like, why did he return to his home and live there? As like, you know, the shamus of a shul. And we travel, Berg's has, you know, Salish, Chist, you know, Svailava. So I know that region. So it might be a film you're interested in because it really, you see the countryside of the Carpathian sure, Mountains. And our, our family would love to see it, you know, even if we don't screen it at the, at the synagogue. And Leonard Nimoy was a member of Adat Shalom of our synagogue uh, for many years. So the connections just keep coming, Yale. It, does, it doesn't stop. Please tell us about your book. Okay, well, uh, this is book number 14, if I may say, folks. Um, let's see if I can. It's called... Shloimel Boimel. Shloimel Boimel and his lucky dreidel. Shloimel, Solomon, Shloimel. Boimel? It means oil. So Solomon oil in English and his lucky dreidel. It's a children's story. Uh, anywhere from, you know, if you read it to kids that are five or six years old to, um, I would say 10, 11 years old. Uh, it's not your typical just picture book. It's uh, driven more by text, though there's illustrations by uh, Emil Singer Fuhr, Hungarian Jew living in Budapest today. But what I'm really proud about is it's English as we read it like this and Yiddish. Oh, so we could write to love. Just turn it over. And so the small publishing house in Lund, Sweden, it's been around about 10 years now, and the husband and wife, Jewish, decided to dedicate themselves to publishing new uh, works as, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as re, uh, reviving uh, uh, books that had not been published for years, uh, Yiddish, and particularly children's material. And when I say it's for children, all those who want to start on Yiddish, this is a good book because children's books, so because I bet many of you listening to this, uh, the show will say, um, well, my Yiddish is kind of, so this is the kind of Yiddish you want to start. And when I say Yiddish, not transliterated folks, Yiddish, Yiddish. Oh. Um, but what's interesting about the story is um, it's based upon my ethnographic research in Romania. I was in the, in the Northeastern part, in Romania has provinces. And one province is known as Moldavia. The capital of the region of Moldavia is Yash, I-A-S-I, -I, it's pronounced Yash, or in, in Jewish, in Yiddish, Yos, um, and a university town. But it's a town where Yiddish musical theater began. Now, what's so interesting about that? Well, Yiddish musical theater, it's music, it's Yiddish, it's stories. But those people who don't know, Yiddish musical theater is the antecedent to, Yiddish, uh, to Broadway musical theater. And we know that that's a whole course I talk about in lectures, et cetera. Um, and, the connect, and by the way, Leonard Nimoy, for a quick aside, people might not know Star Trek and his photography and his movies, his directing. Do you know that his first gigs in theater, he was acting under the direction of Maury, Maurice Schwartz in Yiddish theater. No, Leonard Nimoy. No. Le Le Label was his name, Label. His Jewish name. Anyhow, so I was so I had heard a story from the town of Bohush, 
uh, where there once was a Bahusha Rebbe. Actually, there is a Bahusha Rebbe today in either Yushalayim or B'nai Brak. I think it's B'nai Brak. Um, and he had told me a story about this guy and about Hanukkah. Anyhow, the seeds were there and, you know, just another memory. And then um, when I decided to write this story for in, in Hanukkah, because, you know, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, every year come, is Hanukkah. Why not a new story instead of just the same old story? And so that gave me the impetus to write this. I was very, I'm very proud of it. And they, they did an excellent job. So I hope people get it. It's Shlomo Boimo. You can find it on Etsy, E-T-S-Y, because it's a small publisher, .com, or in the United States also, the Yiddish Book Center is uh, distributing it. Very um, so, you know, it, and it's the hero Shlomo is a klezmer trombonist. And he saves the day. I just, I won't give it away, but it, it deals with oil, very special oil from the land of Eretz Yisroel. Terrific, terrific. The, the book sounds lovely. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's close the episode with uh, perhaps another tune. Um, what are we gonna be hearing? So this one I'm gonna play, I did not have to go so far as Eastern Europe to learn. I, I only had to learn it, to, I only had to be present at the tables of my mother and father. And we would sing this on Shabbos afternoon sometimes. And this is a Hasidic melody. As I said, my father's side of the family, his dad and mother, my Zayd and Boba came from Stolin. They were fathers of the Stolin and Hasidim. And, um, and, as, and they were known as some great composers of music uh, and, and the beaut beautiful and the good name. So this melody I'll play, is known as the, uh, well, in our family, we call it the stall song, as in stalling for time. And, and why? Because my father said when he was growing up in Detroit uh, and there was a stall or a stiebel still there. Um, so it's Yom Kippur. He tells a story. He's probably 10, 11 years old and he's fasting. He doesn't have to, but he wants to prove it, that he can fast. Even though he had a little apple, he said in his sight, you know, because his mother made sure to just in case he, you know, he plots his, he, he can't handle the long 20, 20 more like 25, 26 hours, not 24 hours. And so that they finish, they dive in, there's vanilla, they, they close the arc, they're ready to blow the chauffeur, you know? And then the Rebbe, he stepped outside, comes back in. I don't see the three stars just quite yet. So let's sing one more song. My father's saying, what the heck? Blow, you know, he didn't say right, damn, right. but he's probably thinking, blow the damn chauffeur. I'm starving. I'm thirsty. The Rebbe wants to sing another song. So anyhow, they sing this song, then they blow the chauffeur. So in our house, it was always known as the, the, the song to stall for time.
Dale, I can't thank you enough for joining us. And uh, I look forward to welcoming you back to Adat Shalom, um, God willing, sometime soon. Yes, we will. Rabbi, thank you so much. A shout out to Leslie. Thank you, Leslie. Absolutely. Have a, have a wonderful day. Stay you safe. Bye-bye.